All right, um, again, I've got a few announcements about the film program. So the following movies are on. Promised Land at 9.30, you'll miss that. Beginning of the End of Affair, Graham Greene at 11.15. Trinity and Beyond at 1.15. And Human and Neanderthal and A World Without Water at 3.30. And again, they're all in Lecture Theatre 1 in the Economics Building, which you should have found your way to by now. Um, and they want you on time. Okay, now, today and tomorrow, I'm going to be looking at the great central epic of the Ulster Cycle, the Toyn Bolkulnia, or the Cattle Raid of Cooley, or possibly the Driving of the Bull of Cooley. Now, honour, both individual and collective, was, you'll remember, very important in Celtic society, uh, in the society of the Toyn. And you'll remember also that the society has evolved ways of dealing with, this with the inevitable competition that this emphasis on status is going to bring. So in the story of Macbeth's Pig, we saw at least initially verbal competition, where you know, they stand up and challenge Cat, and Cat tells them who, he, who he's killed, and um, they back down. Um, Outside arbitration and impartial testing are used in Brie Crew's Feast to establish who's going to have the champion's portion for Ulster. So there's several things to note before we begin the toy. The first is that, obviously, warfare is the ultimate arbitrator of who's got the highest status, but it is also not in the general interest to go to war. Um, so therefore, we get the substitution of things like verbal competition or single combat even. Um, the second point is that the winner only wins if the loser admits defeat. We saw that in Brig Cruz's Feast. The whole problem was that Conal Kernak and Loira wouldn't accept defeat. Uh, it also means that Mac the story of Macrathos Pig can end in a draw, because neither province has to admit defeat. Um, Conal Cairnach gets the champion's portion, Fairloga gets the praise of the women of Ulster, and nobody gets the dog. So it's a draw, and everybody's happy. And the third point is that status disputes within provinces are more problematic than those between provinces, uh, as the need to avoid civil wars that much greater. And we saw that with um, Rick Cruz's feast, but also in a way with the exile of the sons of Bushla that civil war is much more destructive to a society than uh, war but with another province. So with these things in mind, let's take a look at how the toy begins. I've already talked about the origin of the bulls, you know, how they're these mystical swine herds who keep changing shapes and end up um, being swallowed as maggots and then born as bulls. And They've been locked in battle for an indeterminate length of time. So there's something elemental about this battle, and of course it can't end until one or the other is finally defeated and knows it. The implication of all that is that this battle is inevitable, part of a pattern that just has nothing to do with the human world in which it takes place. But there's another beginning to the story, another more human origin for the Toyn, which also hinges on the question of status and the refusal to accept defeat. And it begins not simply within a province, but within a marriage. This is the story of the pillow talk of Eilil and Maeve. Now, you'll remember that Eilil and Maeve are the king and queen of Connacht, joint rulers. Um, this is the main rival province to Ulster. All is well until one day when they're in bed, Eilil says something that perhaps a sensible husband would have kept to himself. It is true what they say, love, Eilil says, said. <clears throat> it is well for the wife of a wealthy man. True enough, the woman said. What put that in your mind? It struck me, Eilil said, how much better off you are today than the day I married you. I mean, really. I was well enough off without you, Meth said. Then your wealth was something I didn't know or hear much about, Eilil said, except for your woman's things and the neighboring enemies making off with loot and plunder. Okay, uh, well, you can imagine this doesn't go down well with Maeve. Uh, and her response, which goes on for a page and a half without taking a breath, um, gives us quite a lot of information about her background. She's one of six daughters of the High King of Ireland and considers herself the highest and haughtiest of them, outdoing the others in grace and giving in battle and warlike combat. 
She claims to have 1,500 mercenaries, all the sons of exiles, and the same number of freeborn native men, and also for every paid soldier, I had 10 more men and nine more and eight and seven and six and five and four and three and two and one. That's just in her regular household. And for those of you who are mathematically minded and wondering what that comes to, that's 55 extra men for each paid soldier, which would come to a total household of 82,500. But these numbers are rhetorical. There's no way that she had that many people. And Maeth also claims that she is Queen of Connacht in her own right, having been given the province by her father, and that Eilil only rules as her husband. And this is possible if we, there may be a matriarchal or at least matrilineal um, element to sections of Celtic society. It's quite possible. You think of Queen Boudicca in, in Britain, the same sort of thing. <clears throat> she chose her own husband, and as she says, ask a harder wedding gift than any woman asked before from a man in Ireland, the absence of meanness and jealousy and fear. Her reasoning is that because she is generous and spirited, she claims to thrive on all kinds of trouble, and given her behavior, that does seem plausible. But if she's generous and spirited, it would be an insult to her husband's honor if he were inferior to her in either respect, but not if they're equally matched. As for jealousy, if I married a jealous man, that would be wrong too. I never had one man without another waiting in his shadow. Now, the negative view of Maeve as wanton, which sometimes surfaces, may reflect the moral reaction of the Christian scribes writing the tale down. If we think of Maeve as a tutelary goddess, an embodiment of the sovereignty of the province, the statement makes more sense. There is always another ruler waiting to take over. And also, if the rule of the province depends on marrying the queen, um, you, and you need someone who can lead the warriors in battle, then as soon as one husband dies, she's going to be taking another one. <clears throat> Sovereignty always passes on. You know, it can't just hang in abeyance. And Maeve also claims that contrary to what Eilil has said, he's the one who has been enriched by marrying her. When we were promised, I brought you the best wedding gift a bride can bring, apparel enough for a dozen men, a chariot worth thrice seven bondmaids, so that's four cows to the bondmaid, so that's 84 cows that's worth, the width of your face of red gold and the weight of your left arm of light gold. So if anyone causes you shame or upset or trouble, the right to compensation is mine, Meth said, for you're a kept man. <laughs> Now, in Irish law, an individual's status in marriage depended on how much wealth he or she brought to the marriage. Equal shares meant equal rights. Um, so they had gender equality as long as you had enough money. Um, and if, as Mev claims, Eilil is financially dependent on her, then he would be fair fograma, a man under her authority. She would have the, um, the upper hand in the marriage. And in such a case, Mev would be entitled to compensation for any wrong done to Eilil, as she's the head of the family. Unlike Roman law, Irish law allowed married women to retain control of their own wealth. And unlike Germanic law, it allowed women the right of inheritance. We have seen in other tales that there is an emphasis on matrilineal descent. I've mentioned it a couple of times, um, with characters being frequently identified by their mothers rather than their fathers. Eilil counters Meth's claim with his own claim that he, in fact, is the rightful ruler of Connacht, claiming through his mother. So we've got a matrilineal descent that he is using to establish his claim, but also denying the legitimacy of female rule. I never heard in all Ireland of a province run by a woman except this one, which is why I came and took the kingship here, in succession to my mother, Mata Murishk, Magas, Magak's daughter. So he's a, at both rejecting and accepting the legitimacy of female rule, because if it's illegitimate, then his mother had no right to, to, the, um, to the rule. The question of who the rightful ruler is is shelved, as it's not something that can be easily proven or disproven. They return to the first issue. It still remains, Med said, that my fortune is greater than yours. You amaze me, Eilil said. No one has more property or jewels or precious things than I have, and I know it. So, like any couple in this kind of dispute, what do they do? They get out of bed and they start counting. 
Um, they start with the lowliest of their possessions and work their way up, counting their buckets and tubs and iron pots, jugs and wash pails and vessels with handles, then moving on to the jewelry, their finger rings, bracelets, thumb rings and gold treasures, clothing, their cloth of purple, blue, black, green and yellow, plain gray and many colored, yellow, brown, checked and striped. Then they move on to what really counts as wealth in their society, the livestock. And here again, everything matches. They have the same number of sheep, and each has a ram worth one bond made by himself. That's four cows. Um, their studs of horses are equal, and each of them has a stallion worth a bond made by himself. And the same happens with the pigs. Each has a fine boar. In all of these, the worth of the herd or flock is focused on the mention of the male herd leader. And in each of these, Maeth holds her own with Eileen. In fact, the way it's phrased, Eileel is the one having to match Maeth. We're told what she has, and then Eileel has another one. Um, when they get to the cattle, the real measure of wealth, basic unit of wealth you know, being a, a milch cow, these are not just counted, but they're matched and measured and noted also and found to be the same in number and size. It must have been really a pain for the household who are having to do all this measuring in the middle of the night. But there's one thing that Eilil has that Mev doesn't. But there was one great bull in Eilil's herd that had been a calf of one of Mev's cows. Finbanach was his name, the white-horned. And Finbanach, refusing to be led by a woman, had gone over to the king's herd. Mev couldn't find in her herd the equal of this bull, and her spirits dropped as though she hadn't a single penny. <laughs> Now, Finbanach, you'll remember, is the incarnation of one of the magical pig keepers of the Shi. He begins as part of Maeve's herd, but rejects matriarchy. How do they know that that was his reason? I mean, the bull presumably can't say, I'm leaving because this is a woman in charge. But he rejects matriarchy in favor of patriarchy, in line with the ethos of a cattle-rearing warrior society, which is what we have in the tales. However, there is a solution. Another bull exists who is the equal of Finbanach. Now, we don't actually know the opinion of this other bull on female rule. Um, he may have the same feeling as, as um, Finbanach does. But Med sees him as a solution. And interestingly, she initially only asks for the loan of him for a year. How will that solve the problem? Um, but in the story, she's willing to pay generously for just one year. At the end of the year, this is what she's willing to pay the owner of the Don Kulnia. At the end of the year, he can have 50 yearling heifers in payment for the loan and the brown bull of Kulnia back. And you can offer him this too, Makroth, if the people of the country think badly of losing their fine jewel, the Don Kulnia. If Dara himself comes with the bull, I'll give him a portion of the plain of Ai equal to his own lands and a chariot worth thrice seven bondmaids and my own friendly thighs on top of that. <laughs> Maeve's friendly thighs are going to turn up again later. Initially, negotiations for the loan of the bull go well. In fact, Dara was delighted and jumped for joy till the seams of the cushion burst unto him, under him. So just jumping up and down with the, at the idea of all these presents, rating the gifts of Maeve higher than the potential anger of the Ulsterman. All would have been perfectly well if people hadn't started talking and talking competitively. The Connacht messengers begin by discussing the merits of Dara, but it quickly becomes a matter of comparison, and things get more complicated when a third messenger joins in. This messenger here said, the man of the house here is a good man. A good man, certainly, the other said. Is there a better man in Ulster, the first messenger said? There is, certainly, the second messenger said. His leader, Conquivor, is a better man. If the whole of Ulster gave in to him, it would be no shame for them. But it was, it was good of him to give us what the four strong provinces of Ireland would be needed to take from Ulster. I'd as soon see the mouth that said that spout blood. We would have taken it anyway, with or without his leave. Okay. This is overheard by Dara's men, and from there, there can be no going back. Dara informs Mac Roth, the ambassador, that he has changed his mind because you said if I didn't give it willingly, the hosts of Ireland and the Mev and Fergus's cunning would make me give. Macroth argues that this is just the messenger's drunken talk, but when he has to go back to Maeve and explain why Dora is not willing to lend the bull, her response is simple. We needn't polish the knobs and knots in this, Macroth, Maeve said. It was well known it would be taken by force if it wasn't given freely, and taken it will be. Connacht 
can't back down and accept a refusal now because it would imply that they're weaker than Ulster. So Eilil and Maeve therefore prepare to take the bull by the horns, or at least to take the bull. Um, not only do they collect an army of Connacht at Crooch and I, their stronghold, um, now Rathcrogan in, in, um, in the west of Ireland, but they send out messengers to the other provinces of Ireland so that Ulster will have to face the rest of Ireland, and also Fergus MacRoyth, Conquivor's son Cormac Conlongus, and those 3,000 ex exiles who left Ulster because of the slaying of the sons of Ushlo. So they are assembling a massive army. Eilil and Mev, just as they're setting out, seek omens for their success. The charioteer turns the chariot to the right, passing sunwise around Crook. And you'll remember that Cuchulain turned his chariot to the left um, after when he returned from his first tour of the borders. So turning opposite the sun like that, Widdershins, was seen as a bad omen. Um, so they want to get all the good omens they can get. They also encounter Fedalum, a woman poet, who's also a prophetess and has just returned from learning verse and vision in Alba. So going off to Scotland to improve your education seems to be a standard literary practice, at least, whether they really went or not is another matter. Hearing that she has the imbas forasni, the light of foresight, Med naturally asks for a prediction, asking, how seest thou the host? Fedelam's reply, I see it crimson, I see it red, is initially rejected by Med, who clearly has spies in Ulster, as she knows that Concavor and all the Ulster warriors are suffering from the pangs of Macha, uh, which we've also mentioned before. She therefore doesn't expect Ulster to be able to offer any resistance to the invading army. When Fedelam repeats, I see it crimson, I see it red, Maeve points out that one third of Ulster's forces have not yet arrived and possibly may not come. And they also have Fergus and his exiles with them. So not only is Concavor incapacitated because of Macha's Gish, but a sizable section of the Ulster forces aren't available to him or not on his side. Fedelam again repeats, I see it crimson, I see it red, and Meb tries to dismiss this by saying that wrath and rage and red wounds are common with our, when armies and large forces gather. In other words, there will be a certain amount of fighting and squabbling among the warriors of Ireland. This is not unlikely, given the individual touchiness of Celtic warriors and the mixed nature of the army, but it doesn't, for Maeve, necessarily mean that they will lose. Fetlam then refines her prediction in a poem which specifies a single man holding off the entire Irish army. I see a battle, a blond man with much blood about his belt and a hero halo round his head. His brow is full of victories. His great valor brings to mind Cuchulain of Murthevna, the hound of Cullen, full of fame. Who he is, I cannot tell, but I see now the whole host colored crimson by his hand. Whole hosts he will destroy, making dense massacre. In thousands you will yield your heads. I am Fedelam, I'd hide nothing. So they've been warned, but they set out nevertheless, and we are given first an itinerary of the route they took. So this is, let's see if I can get this. There they start, Crook and I, and they go along here. Oh, and there are various options. Let's say, um, take some detours, uh, but where they're heading for, is up here. So they've got a fair ways to go. Um, and up there, you've got Ion Maka. There's Sleefu at the Fuse Mountains. Ion Maka's right up at the top there. So they're going further and further into Ulster. Um, and more, we get a more detailed description of what happened along the way, obviously. Not surprisingly, such a diverse army has internal problems. Mev, who is expecting the, inspecting the troops from the outset, announces to Ailil that it, it would be foolish to go on if they let the troop of 3,000 Galeon from North, from North Leinster come with them. Her reason is not that they're slacking, but they are too efficient. When everyone else is still clearing space for their camp, they have theirs set up and already preparing their meal. They're too good, and they would get all the credit for the victory. In other words, the rest of the army would lose status. Mev is more concerned about this than Eilil, uh, and her attitude shows her ruthlessness. But they're fighting on our side, Eilil said. They can't come, Mev said. Let them stay then, Eilil said. No, they can't stay either, Mev said. They would only come and seize our lands when we're gone. Well, what are we going to do with them, Eilil said, if they can neither stay nor come? Kill them, Mev said. 
That is a woman's thinking and no mistake, Khalil said, a wicked thing to say. These men are our friends, Fergus said, for the Ulster, ex for the Ulster exiles. You will take this evil advice over our dead bodies. Meth actually isn't too bothered about killing the Ulster allies either, or at least she's not simply going to back down, citing how many of her own men she has in the army and the troops of her seven sons, all of whom are named Manya, by the way. Fergus counters by reminding her that as well as the Ulster exiles and the Galleon, he also has the seven Munster kings and their contingents supporting him. He then suggests, as a compromise, that the Galleon be divided up among the various troops so that they can't outshine them too much, and this is agreed to. It does serve to indicate, however, that there's a lack of unity in the invading army. And the Ulster exiles in particular have a divided loyalty. When they get to Gronert, um, Fergus sends a warning to the men of Ulster because of old friendship. They, of course, can't do anything because of the pangs of Macha, but Cuchulain and his father Suldam, who are immune to the curse, um, therefore set out to intercept the invaders at Irart. Go back for a second and see, um, see if I can find Gronert. There's Gronert. And there's Irard. So they're coming down from up here to intercept them. So everybody's moving around quite a lot. Um, there, Cuchulain makes a spancel hoop of challenge and cut an Orm message. Orm is the um, pre-Christian writing form. Um, um, if you remind me at the question time, I'll, give you, I'll show you what it looks like. But I don't want to start putting the screen up now. Uh, but it's it's an ancient writing system still used uh, in some way in some forms today. He made a message into the peg, fastening it, and left it there for them on top of a standing stone. The army of Ar Ireland has already been warned about Cuchulain more than once, and they've been beset by Nimen, one of the three female war spirit spirits of Irish mythology. Her name means panic, so we can assume the army is getting a little nervous about what they've heard about Cuchulain. Um, Fergus is acting as something of a double agent, really. He's guiding the invading army, but in doing so he makes a great detour southward to give Ulster time to gather an army together. When Eilil and Maeve notice and accuse him of treachery, he claims that he's just trying to avoid Cuchulain. When they do come up to Cuchulain's spancel hoop, they find that they can't pass it, because the Orn says, Come no further, unless you have a man who can make a hoop like this with one hand out of one piece, excluding Fergus. It is essentially a challenge to single combat, and Cuchulain does not want to fight Fergus, who's his foster father. Now, you may wonder why the army just doesn't ignore it and continue. Initially, it's because they're not sure what it means, but after Fergus has referred the matter to the Druids, Eileen and Maeve's army must either produce a champion to match Cuchulain's feet, or stay where they are or go another way. Effectively, they're up against the offside rule and the referee's decision, in this case the Druids, is final. Um, if they do ignore the challenge and continue, they'll be breaking the rules, and they will therefore no longer be entitled to the protection of the rules. They will not be safe, even if they're in their own homes, because fair play doesn't apply anymore. So there are rules to these battles, and they've got to obey them. So instead of passing the Spancel Hoop, they go a different way. They have to contend with natural phenomena, such as snow, which hinders them. And Cuchulain, meanwhile, gets to the next ford and places another obstacle in the path, this time a forked branch blocking the ford, which, for added measure, he decorates with the heads of two Irish warriors and their charioteers, who, unluckily for them, arrived just as he was preparing his barricade. The, this branch has been cut from, with a single stroke by a single man and thrown into the ford with a single cast, and unless the invaders, excluding Fergus, can do this. They can't go past. Fergus explains all this to Eileen and Maeve, and they begin to wonder who's done it. Fergus dismisses all of their suggestions. Conquer himself, Celt Kar Mac Uther, Elchen Mac on the grounds that none of those would come into the border country without a full battle force around him. He then tells them about Cuchulain, and this leads to the relating uh, to, by the Ulster exiles of Cuchulain's boyhood deeds, which we looked at yesterday. So Cuchulain continues to do this, put obstacles in the way of Isla and Meb's army that they can't pass until they've matched his exploit. He can slow them down, and it begins to annoy Meb. And you'll remember Freuch that I mentioned earlier, about one of the warriors, who, the one who got promised Finnebar, Finnevar's hand in return for cattle and coming on the, on the town. So 
he's there and um, may have then says to him, basically, right, go out and, as she puts it, clear this nuisance away. Go and fight Cahollan. So we've now got a more formal type of fight than has occurred up to now. Uh, Freud is accompanied by nine others, but they take no part in the fighting. It's just a, a fair fight between the two. Um, Koholin is washing in the river, and Freike attacks him there because he isn't good in water. That's the reason he's given. Now, this is a little optimistic and completely untrue. Um, Koholin is actually very good in water. Um, Koholin is reluctant to kill Freike, but he has to fight. And Freike style, chooses a style of fighting which seems to involve wrestling in the water and trying to drown each other. Freike is defeated, but refuses to yield. So. Now, Koholan said, will you let me spare you? I wouldn't have that said, Freuch said. Koholan thrust him down once more, and Freuch perished. For Freuch, the damage to his honor, his public image that would result from allowing Koholan to spare him and having it said that he was spared, is more to be avoided than death. And Koholan accepts this view readily. His followers, Freuch's followers, take his body back to the camp, and... Then they saw a troop of women in green, green tunics gather about the body of Freuch Makvidig and bear him away into the Shi. Shi Freuch is the name of that, of that hill since that time. Uh, green, incidentally, is a color associated with the Shi, and Freuch's mother was one of the Shi, and it continues to be an indication, green continues to be an indication of supernatural origin in fairyland throughout the Middle Ages and considerably later in Celtic cultures and indeed in English culture as well by association. Now the association with Freud's death with the explanation of a place name um, is an example of Din Hinnikus, the a separate class of stories that explain the origins of place names. We saw it earlier with um, Moy Alva, when the plain of Alva. And as you can imagine, an origin in the Toyn would have a certain appeal. You know, if you're trying to boost your, your town's importance having an origin of your place name in the toy makes you more, more tourist appeal, I guess. Um, and stories of what route the toy took tend to multiply. And this began to happen quite early, as even the earliest surviving versions of the toy are aware of drawing on various traditions, as, for example, in the lines immediately following the Freuch incident. Some say they went from here to Arth Meschler, where Cochulain slew six of the host, Meschler and the others. Others they say they went to Arth Tartan, and that Cochulain slew there t six Dungals of, or of Eros. As we've seen already, there's certain ideas about how a warrior should behave. Celtic warriors are not expected to be chivalrous in the way that Sir Lancelot would be, for instance. But there are things that are done and things that are not done, or not necessarily or not without risking loss of honor. Just as in the Arthurian stories, only a bad knight would attack Sir Lancelot's horse rather than Sir Lancelot, so in the Celtic stories, it's not quite the done thing to fight the charioteer rather than the chariot warrior, unless he's attacking you. That's not to say that charioteers were completely safe, as the story of Orlam and his uh, charioteer shows. It also illustrates some of the difficulties of knowing who's who in a war like this. Cohullan finds a charioteer cutting wood to make a new shaft for the chariot, and they each assume that the other is on their own side, although Cohullan finds out the truth first. The charioteer assumes that Cohullan is just another charioteer and asks for his help. What are you doing here, Cohullan said. Getting chariot shafts, the charioteer said. We smashed our chariots chasing that wild deer, Cohullan. Help me with them, he said. Would you rather cut out the shafts or do the trimming? I'll do the trimming, Cohullan said. Then, under the other's eyes, he stripped the holly shafts through his clutched fist, paring them clean, knot and bark. The charioteer said in fright, This isn't your usual work. <laughs> the charioteer then, in response to Cuchulain's questions, admits that his master is Orlam, son of Ailil and Mev. He's rather dismayed when he finds out who Cuchulain is, but Cuchulain reassures him slightly that he is only intending to kill Orlam, saying, I have no quarrel with charioteers. Having killed Orlam, he takes off his head, straps it to the charioteer's back, and sends him to Alain Mev's camp with instructions to keep it like that all the way into the camp. If you do anything but exactly what I say, you'll get a shot from my sling. The charioteer, unluckily for him, meets Alain Mev outside the camp and stops to tell them about their son. This is breaking the letter of Cuchulain's command, so Cuchulain hurled a stone at him, shattering his head so that the brains spattered the ears. His name was Fertadil. It is not true, therefore, that Cuchulain didn't kill charioteers. He killed them if they did wrong. 
The rules are only valid as long as people agree to keep them. Cuchulain is next attacked by six enemies, including three charioteers at once, thus breaking the rules of fair fight, but he slew them all. Cuchulain also continues to annoy the Irish army, using his slingshot to let, him know, let them know he's still there. He kills, for instance, Meth's pet squirrel as it sits on her shoulder, and Ailil's pet bird in the same situation. Both of these serve to remind Ailil and Maeve how easily he could kill them. Underestimating Cuchulain also leads to downfall. He can't be far off, Ailil said one time to his sons, the Manya. They rose up, looking about them. As they were settling down again, Cuchulain struck one of them, shattering his head. That was a fine way to rise against him, Monane, the just jester said. After all your boasting, I would have knocked his head off, at which a stone from Cuchulain shattered his head also. The following, then, is the list of the slain. Orlam, firstly on the hill that bears his name, fair to deal between two protectors, the three sons of Garak on their ford, and Monane on his hill. I swear by the god of my people, Aliel said, I'll cut in two any man who scoffs at Cuchulain from now on. Let us be off now, traveling day and night, he said, until we get to Kulnia. The man will kill two-thirds of our army if he goes on like this. So as you can see, the morale of the army is definitely being affected by Cuchulain's guerrilla tactics. Mev, whom Cuchulain has vowed to hurl a sling stone at if he ever sees her, <clears throat> never went about unless she was protected by half her army holding a barrel-shaped shelter of shields over her heads. The Morrigan, probably the most powerful of the Celtic war goddesses, now appears not to Cuchulain, but to the brown bull of Colne. And she predicts, raging over Colne, death of sons, death of kinsmen, death, death. The bull then, accompanied by his 50 heifers and the herdsmen, moves away from his pasture to slay of Colne, so that when Eileen and Maeve arrive at Colne and lay waste to the countryside, rounding up all the women and boys and cattle and, and girls and cattle in Colne, they still have not succeeded because, as Maeve points out, I don't see the bull with you. When they do find the bull, he also fights them, killing 50 heroes and the cowherd. Even the land begins to fight against them. The river Cron rose up against them to the height of the treetops, barring their passage and giving Cuchulain the opportunity to kill more of them, including the two chroniclers of the time, Roa and Oroi, because you've got to have your chroniclers coming along to tell what happens. It's like having news cameras with you. And so the text tells us that this is the reason that some people, this is what some people consider the reason that Torin was lost and had to be rediscovered. Other rivers similarly are in flood, and the difficulties of progress become greater as they enter Ulster. Now the text give, gives us alternative versions of progress for this section. Either they went by all the swollen rivers, as I've mentioned, or they divided the host. Ailil taking one half and Maeve and Fergus the other. This leads to one of the subplots of the story. You'll remember that one of the things that Maeve promised in return for the load, uh, loan of the bull was the freedom of her friend, the friendship of her thighs, Maeve's friendly thighs. Um, and Maeve's friendly thighs come back into the story at this point. You'll also remember that what she valued um, in a husband was freedom from jealousy, because she always had one man in the shadow of, the, of another. Alil, when the army divides, has his charioteer, Culeus, spy on Fergus and Mev. Culeus finds them together and steals Fergus's sword while the couple are otherwise occupied, um, and he takes it to Alil as evidence. Well, Alil said. Well, indeed, Culeus said. Here's your sign. I discovered them sleeping together as you thought. Fair enough, Alil said, and they grinned at each other. It is all right, Alil said. She is justified. She does it to keep his help on the toy. Now keep the sword in good order. Put it under your chariot seat with a piece of linen around it. When Fergus discovers his sword is missing, he cuts a wooden one to replace it, and there's a running thread of jokes against Fergus throughout the toyne about his artificial sword, all very Freudian. Um, and there's quite a long section of rather obscure poetry between Fergus and Eilil as they play fifth gel, the Celtic equivalent of chess. And it's Eilil sort of digging at um, Fergus about this sword. But meanwhile, Cuchulain's killing of the Irish army continues. Now, the alternative story to the rising of the River Cron is that Cuchulain and his charioteer make a stand there against the host of Ireland, and that Cuchulain calls on the land to help him resist the invaders. 
I summon the waters to help me, Cullen said. I summon air and earth, and I summon now above all the Cron River. Let Cron itself fall too in the fight to save Murthavna from the enemy until the warrior's work is done on the mountaintop of Ochana and the water reared up to the treetops. So the idea that the land itself is alive and can fight is something that we see in, in Celtic literature. Now, the Irish army is seriously de demoralized by this time. Lugad MacNoish Alcharag, who is the son of a sub-king of Munster, um, so he's an ally rather than a subject to Island Mev, and he's also a foster brother of, of um, Cohelens. He's the one who didn't marry Emer. He goes to Cohelen, and he's, with whom he's on friendly terms, and Cohelen is clearly well disposed towards him, saying that if he had two birds or two salmon, he would give one and a half of them to Lugath. Um, Lugath responds by saying that Cohelen could hold off the entire army single-handed, which Cohelen admits he could do if he was meeting them one at a time. Oh, I seem to have got another. This is the sort of detailed part of the, um, the map. Of the area around Colnia where they're getting the bull. Um, so there, there's Baroness Bull Colnia. Um, if it was one by one the army came against me, your Ulster enemy wouldn't disgrace you, Lugath, Cuchel, and said. I have right and might to sustain me. Friend Lugath, he said, do the hosts fear me? I swear by the gods, Lugath said, they daren't make water in ones and twos outside the camp but have to go in twenties and thirties. I have something new for them, Cohelan said. I am taking up sling throwing. <coughs> Tell me now, Lugath, what you want. What Lugath wants is that his own followers be spared. Cohelan promises this on condition that they give some sign that he can rec so he can recognize them. A badge, perhaps, and offers the same protection to Fergus and his followers and to the healers. Avoiding killing medical personnel is further evidence of the concept of fair play and warfare, you know, the Red Cross and things like that. Um, Cohelan requires in return that they must swear to watch over my life and send me food every night. So he also has his vulnerability. When Eilil finds out that Cohelan is avoiding killing Fergus's men, he asks Fergus to take Eilil's company in amongst them. Fergus asks permission for this from Cohelan first, accompanying his request with a nice present of an ox, a salt pig, and a barrel of wine. Cohelan's reply it is all the same to me where he goes, it is ambiguous, as we are told that even though the two troops mingle together, even so Cohelan destroyed 30 of Eilil's warriors with his sling, so it doesn't matter where they are, he's still going to get them. Eilil and Mev are now up against a serious problem. Things are growing worse for you, Fergus said. The men of Ulster will soon rise from their pangs, and then they'll grind you to grit and gravel. Besides, this is a bad place to fight. With his slingshot, Cohelan can pick them off at a steady rate and demoralize the army completely. A sniper is always hard on morale. Eilil is worried that his army will just melt away, either through death or possibly desertion. I mean, there's no reason the Munster kings should stay if they're going to get just picked off one by one. So he tries to buy Cohelan off. He offers initially an equal grant of land in Connacht to Cohelan's land in Murthavna, the best chariot at I, and a harness for a dozen men. Or, alternatively, if Cohelan doesn't want to relocate, 21 female slaves and full compensation for anything of Cohelan's that the invading army has destroyed. And they've been in Cohelan's territory for quite some time, so they probably destroyed quite a lot. Eilil asks in return that Cohelan take service under me, probably in the form of clientship that was a feature of Celtic society. This arrangement is not a dishonorable one, as alliances and allegiances were shifting and conditional in, in Celtic society. Unlike feudal service, where the overlord and vassal relationship was fixed, Celtic service was voluntary and negotiable, and it was acceptable to shift from one protector to another, provided that one did it openly. Macroth, who had led the original delegation to Dara to ask for the brown bull, is given the task of carrying the proposal to Cahullan. Cahullan recognizes Macroth from his attire as a herald because he holds a peeled hazel wand in one hand and a single-edged sword with guards of ivory in the other. Macroth, however, does not recognize the young man squatting haunch deep in the snow, stripped and picking his shirt, and asks him whose servant in, in, ar whose servant in arms he is. I serve Conquivor Macnessa, was the reply, which to Mac Roth is not very helpful, as he expected a slightly more immediate master to be named. However, he gives his message. Where can I find Cahullan, Mac Roth said. What have you to say to him, Cahullan said. 
Macross gave him the full message. If Koholan were here, he wouldn't sell his mother's brother for another king. Here, it's the kinship bond which is the dominant one, although, as you will remember, this was subordinated to provincial loyalty in the episode of Koholan's killing of his own son. Macroth returns with another proposal, that Koholan will receive all the noblest women and all the milkless cattle from the plunder that the Irish army has taken, and all the milkless cattle, um, sorry, if he will just stop using his sling at night. They don't mind how many he kills during the day, but the slingshot at night is getting on their nerves. Now, Koholan refuses the proposal, for if you take away the bond women, our free women will have to take to the grinding stones, and if you take away our milch cows, we would have to go without milk. As dairy products, especially butter, were a major part of the Irish diet, doing without milk would be a serious loss. The next alternative, that Cúhollán keep the bond women and the milch cows, is also unacceptable. I can't agree to that either, Cúhollán said, for the men of Ulster would sleep with the bond women and beget slavish sons, and they would use the milch cows for meat in winter. Cúhollán then tells Macroth that there is a condition on which he will stop, agree to stop killing them at night, but they have to work it out for themselves. Now, Fergus knows immediately what he intends. Oh, sorry, I should have. I know what he has in mind, Fergus said, and indeed it bodes you no good. This is his plan, that it will be he will fight you one by one in the ford, and no cattle will be taken from the ford for a day and a night after each combat. This plan will gain, him time, will gain time for him until help comes from the men of Ulster. And I am surprised, Fergus said, that they are so long recovering from their pangs. It will be easier on us, no doubt, Eilil said, to lose one man every day than a hundred every night. Cohollan's battle with Eilil and Maeve's army up to this point has been partly haphazard. He kills men at random when he encounters them, or with his slingshot, and partly structured. He prevents them from crossing at certain places by placing obstacles which they are not allowed to pass until they have equaled his feet in putting them there. The difficulty is that they are able to take alternative routes, and they are still progressing towards their destination, albeit at a fairly heavy cost in men, and with morale in the army becoming dangerously low. The new arrangement is more structured, in that the army cannot cross a ford until they have provided a champion to fight Cahulan in single combat, and they can't take any cattle back across it for a day and a half after the fight, or a day and a night after the fight. But they do get to progress once the battle has been undertaken. The advantage for them is that the death rate will drop dramatically, as Eilil recognized, and of course they also believe that they will be able to find a champion who can kill Cahulan. The disadvantage for them is that while they are waiting for the fight to finish each day, the Ulster warriors will be getting nearer the end of their pangs, and they don't know how long it will be before they have to face the entire army of Ulster. For Cahulan, any delay is an obvious advantage, as it gives more time for the Ulith to get there. On the other hand, he is placing himself at much greater personal risk. Even if he is the greater, greatest warrior in Ulster, and he is, he's still only one man, and will be facing a constant stream of fresh champions from the Connacht army. It's not a one-sided bargain by any means, and there is the added advantage for both sides that it's much more honor-enhancing form of combat than the sniper in the night method that they're currently engaged in. The image of Cúhollán standing alone against the forces of the rest of Ireland is the dominant one of the time. Fergus is sent to accept Cúhollán's terms and is accompanied by Etercóval, foster son of Eilil and Maeve. And Fergus reluctantly gives Etercóval his protection, but only on condition that he not antagonize Cúhollán. Edercovel is the first in a fairly long list of warriors who express contempt for Cullen because of his youth and because he doesn't look like the monster they've all been fearing. He's also the first in a fairly li long line of warriors to be killed for this mistake, although Cullen gives him every chance to back down, cutting in turn the turf from under his feet, the clothes off his back, and the hair off his head before killing him. Cúhollán then submits humbly to Fergus's anger, because he was under Fergus's protection, therefore Fergus is angry at, at Cúhollán. And Edercovel's own charioteer backs up Cúhollán's claim that he could not have honorably done anything else but kill Edercovel. Um, so Edercovel has broken the agreement by antagonizing Cúhollán. Fergus accepts this, and later he tells Eilil and Maeve that Edercovel was an ignorant whelp to pick a fight with the irresistible great hound of Cúhollán. So tomorrow we'll look at how Cohen deals with the various champions that are sent against him. Any questions about that?
Ja. Hm. Why what? Oh, because if he didn't help her, if he said, no, I'm not going to help you, then he would be implying that he was inferior in some way because he was, could only rely on that, that bull to make him superior. And also, they're joint rulers of Connacht. They have to act jointly. But it's still Yes, but Maeve can be pretty persuasive and pretty domineering, <laughs> you know. So um, he would lose honor if he stayed behind once a battle, is, once a war has been declared. And he seems, um, by the end of the story, that they, they can say, oh, this is all Maeve's fault she carried. But yeah, they're warriors. Here's a war. Here's a chance to fight. So they, off they go. Uh, Celtic warriors are not necessarily of the brightest, either. <laughs> yeah. Good. Mm. Um, it's sort of verging on humorous. Yes, and that is in the original. Yeah. The there, 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 there's this very sort of terse statement that you get that, um, that come across as, as humorous, but also I think there's a genuine humor intended because these were stories for entertainment. These weren't just solemn stories. The, um, you know, Irish stories can be tragic and comic at the same time. So that there's, uh, and you get you get stories where these great heroes are put in totally ridiculous situations and made to look really ridiculous. Like I talked about Meshka Ulla, the intoxication of the Ulsterman. I mean, they really they're going on a drunken hooli all over Ireland, and it's. Um, and it is clearly meant to be comic. And I think Shkelemukha is meant to be comic in some ways as well, because the, the, the boasting uh, and the counters to the boasting, if you can make your um, opponent laughed at, then you've won in a way. So there's a sort of, um, and, that, and that's reflected in the stories too. And the other great thing was the equality of the women. Yes, yeah. Yes, under Irish law, women had much more equality than they did um, under later uh, uh, British rule or even modern Irish law. Um, the equality of women was, was actually greater in the prehistoric period than it was in, say, the 19th century or the early 20th. So. In fact, even when I was in Ireland, um, one of my fellow students uh, she said she'd when she she was slightly older and she joined the civil service. Um, but she said if you were in the civil service and you got married, if you were a woman, you had to quit. You know, you, you were that was end of your job because once you're married, you're supposed to be at home raising babies. Um, so that was in the 60s, 70s. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So. So got the gender equality was actually better you know, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> the yes. Well, women, women were seen as slightly ma mystical, slightly dangerous. You know, when I mentioned, I think, that there's a prayer where they may or not meet a company of druids or a company of women or a company of smiths, because those are all three magical groups that are potentially dangerous to you, and you don't want to meet them while getting out, starting out on a journey because you don't know what they're going to do um, <laughs> and what sort of powers they have. So you do get this idea of the um, female power. So. Old Irish. Um, well, it is written in Old Irish. There are versions that are also in Middle Irish because it keeps being written again and again. But the, uh, the language of the earliest text is from the 8th century, which is Old Irish. So it's not the oldest Irish that we have because there are also bits that are 6th century and, and um, in the bits in the poetry. But the, it is designated Old Irish. 
Uh, I don't know whether they're in Trinity or not. Um, probably some of them are. Um, I don't know that they're on public display. Yeah, the Book of the Dun Cow, yes, the Book of Dun the Dun Cow was on display when I was there. Um, so they've now moved the display around and have the Book of Kells um, in a separate display. It used to be great when, because I was, the manuscript that I was working on for my uh, master's thesis was in Trinity and all the sort of things like the Book of Kells and the Book of Darrow and the Book of Dun Cow were all in the um, long room of Trinity and I had to go through the long room and up to the top and so all the tourists were there having to pay to go in and see it and I would just sort of say reader and walk past and pause and look at it. So I got to see the Book of Kells you know, several times for free which always, always pleased me. <laughs> now they've moved it into its own little enclosure so you have to pay no matter what. The writing, yes. I'm going to have to close down the, the um, So we I think I can turn off the power. That's good. Now, screen up. I'm getting very technical minded with all this. Now, the big question is where's the chalk? No chalk. On the table, yes. I knew I'd seen it somewhere. Okay. Okay. It's spelt either Ochum or Ochum, depending whether you're using the older or modern spelling. Um, basically, they're both pronounced the same way um, because in Old Irish, being in the middle of the word changes the pronunciation, so it becomes a, a guttural age. But basically, this is a system of writing that deals with straight lines. So you would have, you get it on um, tombstones or memorial stones where it will tell, and this is some of the oldest um, writing that there is in, in Europe, actually, um, but certainly in Ireland. So you'd have a center line, and then you'd have one or two or three lines, and so basically an increased number of lines. And then there are other things where they go across and straight. And I don't know the old alphabet. I could, I didn't, and I didn't think of getting it all that. But they they're grouped in um, groups of letters. So you got all the vowels together, which. You know, to us it makes perfect sense, but then you get um, the liquids and nasal. Um, there's be sort of five different things. It'll be the the liquids and the nasals, and ng is one of the letters for for no very clear reason. Um, and uh, things like the tdbp will all be in tdppfv. They'll all be one group of letters. So. Um, Phonetically, it's a very useful designation, and it still was uh, still being used well into the 20th century. You'd see carts in the in the south of Ireland that would have little um, um, inscriptions on them. I don't know whether it's actively used now, but it certainly is still. Um, people are aware of it, and you know, there are a lot of old old stones and signs that have got these um, or markings on them because. You can do it, you know, if you think of this straight line, can be the edge of a stone, it can be the edge of a pillar, it can be, or you can do it just as a straight line on a page. So um, you get some of the more fancy ones that have diamonds, but basically, if you can cut a straight line, you can, you can write it. Oh, so if you've got nothing but your sword and you're um, in a, you know, in, Passage tomb in Orkney, actually, Maze How, there are some cuttings of this type in, inside it. And standing stones often would have these things on them saying, this is the boundary, or this is the burial place, or this is in memory of so and so. And that's how we get some of the.